I would say welcome everyone who is joining for this presentation, which is called Beer Fondue or how you can find vulnerabilities thanks to SonarCube. Um, I'm Patrick from the Chavi User Group and I'm really happy to have um, Malte and Nicolas here with me for doing the presentation. And I'm also like really happy that also like um, SonarCube is a Swiss company and has the possibility to show what they're doing. So obviously that's awesome. Um, it's not the first time they're doing the talk. That's also great. So they did, they did already some um, rehearsal at the Java user group in Paris. So this is really great. And that means like they know what they're talking about and how they interact. So um, now it's actually interesting because Malte just jumped out. So I want to do the presentation or uh, the introduction. Um, and they explain you like what kind of channels we have and so on. We are hoping that Malt is coming back in the meantime. Yes, now he's back. So um, <laughs> as you know, we are doing um, these events online already quite a while. Uh, we have a YouTube channel and we have already like many presentations there. So let's hope also the Sonar Cube talk gets um, lots of uh, views. And um, like you could help them to to uh, have more views in in their presentation online. Hey, Malte, what are you doing? Just leave me. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't do anything. Okay, so it seems like um, we have some some glitch uh, in here. It doesn't matter. Um, yes. So as you also know, probably we have a um, Slack channel. So if you have um, questions regarding the talk or other things, and um, you could actually join our Slack channel and there is usually some interaction going on. So sometimes also after the presentations, the, the presenters are meeting there as well and maybe answer like the, some other questions which are popping up a little bit later. Or at least we could forward those questions to them, right? Um, as always, we want to have some feedback from your side. So that means at the end, you get automatically um, forwarded to the feedback form. And that means um, fill out the form and you might win a IntelliJ IDEA license, which we, were, which we do a raffle every month. So we're just giving that away for free. Okay. So <laughs> again, uh, uh, we have uh, some delay and that's probably also fun because um, you will recognize everything about 15 seconds later. So that means if you write something into the chat, we are already like 15 seconds ahead in the future, or at least for you, it seems so. And um, that means sometimes there is an awkward silence. Please be aware of this. So it's not actually our fault or that's just because of the platform and the streaming. There is actually a chat feature. So please use the chat and say hello. And you can do so already if you want to. And tell also everyone where you're um, joining from. Yes, thanks, M. Nicolas. And then actually we have also a, a part where we have um, questions and answers. So if you have questions to Nicolas and Malte, please enter those questions into the Q&A tab. So it's easier actually to recognize us and the questions and I can ask them the questions at the end of the presentation. It just makes things way easier. Right. So polls we don't do tonight. So um, we just can't skip over this. And that means like that's already part of uh, my side from the Java user group. And I'm really happy to hand over to Malte and to Nicolas for a fondue and beer uh, presentation. And for me, actually, this is quite interesting because usually when you do a Swiss presentation and even like from the uh, Swiss French part, you would say that's like white wine and fondue and not beer and fondue but you will find out why a little bit later so enjoy the presentation and see you later okay okay cool here we are uh, okay so we can start so indeed as patrick mentioned today we are talking about beer fondue and we will explain how we actually managed to get uh, the best of two very different worlds very similar but very different world uh, so let's get started and we are going to explain how to, we can find vulnerabilities thanks to SonarCube. So uh, we are both from SonarSource, so I'm Nicolas Peru. 
I've been working at Sonar Source since 2013, so more than seven years now, uh, which seems like uh, like an eternity. I worked a lot at Sonar Source on Java Analyzer and Security Analyzer. So first, so if you're familiar with uh, Sonar Cube and you used it in your uh, in your company, there's a uh, as it is a Java user group, there's a fair chance that you had some uh, some rules have been written uh, that you have probably. Um, um, uh, be angry about. I'm probably responsible for that. I won't take any requests though. Uh, and uh, after uh, working on the Java analyzer, I worked a lot on the security analyzer. So we developed a new way to uh, find vulnerabilities and we'll talk a lot about that later on. Um, and hey, I'm Malte. So I've been a Sona Sosa for much for much shorter time than Nico. Uh, I've been a Sonar Sourcer since April 2017, when actually Sonar Source acquired a company called RIPS that I'm going to tell you about in a second. So um, obviously, before that, I've been working at, at RIPS uh, for about um, uh, two and a half years. <clears throat> and there I worked uh, on the um, SAST engine. So basically, RIPS was a company that developed also uh, a tool to detect vulnerabilities in, in uh, in various, uh, in, well, in source code of various programming languages. And before that, I, I did actually my PhD thesis on the same su subject. So namely on um, automated vulnerability detection in source code. Okay, so um, <clears throat> let me uh, quickly uh, present a little bit uh, those companies. Let's, let's start out with uh, Ripstech. So that's the company where I come from. Um, so, just to give you a quick overview, uh, Rips Technologies is a, a startup that was founded in August of 2016 in a little town in Germany called Bochum. So you probably have never heard of it. Uh, maybe if you're a soccer fan, you may have heard of Dortmund, which is close by. Um, and uh, this company was in the, so basically SAST business, and uh, it was a business to business uh, company. So basically we had this one product, Rips Code Analysis, that allowed um basically other companies to uh, scan their own code detect vulnerabilities automatically and even patch them and uh, so this was still a small company we were uh, 25 full-time workers and we had about uh, 100, 130 customers in the world um and uh, a bit of history so uh, actually rips technologies goes back a long way so it all started in in 2008 when our founder uh, johannes dase uh, participated back then in those ctf competitions where hackers hack one another and they mostly used php for that and so he started developing a tool that would allow him to automatically detect uh, vulnerabilities in php code and this was working so well that he actually published it as an open source tool and he even uh, started working on his own PhD thesis on the subject, which was uh, awarded with the Internet Defense Prize by Facebook in 2014. And then he founded a company actually to sell this product in 2016. And this all became a bit a bit more professional over time. So at the at the beginning, it was only PHP. And then uh, we also released Java support. So actually, uh, myself had a had a big contribution contribution to this Java engine. Um, and we were also developing on uh, on engines for uh, Node.js, C Sharp, and um, and so on. And uh, then in 2020, we were acquired by Sona Source. Um, we have at Rips Technologies on now, now Sona Source Bochum a really great culture, which is which really matches also the culture of uh, uh, Sona Source very well. But uh, in between all the uh, all the fun, we sometimes also work. So we are quite proud, actually, of our uh, know-how, especially in the PHP world. Um, we were um, really, really good at detecting vulnerabilities in PHP since this has been develop developed over a very long time. And just uh, to show you that I'm not telling you stories here, this is a short list of uh, CVEs um, in popular PHP projects like Typo3, Magento, uh, Bitbucket. So CVEs are, um, are vulnerabilities, uh, known vulnerabilities in open source tools that basically have been um, published online for uh, for information purposes and and uh, and patched, of course. And so all of these vulnerabilities that you see here, we've actually found them using our tool. And so this is really quite cool. And now I'm going to let uh, Nico tell you about Sonasource. 
Okay, so Sonar Source has been, uh, it's a, it's a company, it's a Swiss based company. Uh, we are based in Geneva, actually. We can, uh, you can find the company above IKEA. Literally, we are just upstairs. Um, so Sonar Source has been founded in, uh, 2008. We now have four offices in the world. So Geneva, which is the main office, Austin in Texas, Bochum, uh, very recently. And even more recently, uh, Annecy. So we have our offices in France in Annecy. Uh, it's, we are close to 200 person, uh, 200 employees in the company now. I think we are, we are at 190 something. And, uh, Sonarsos is well known actually for its strong culture. So you can see uh, pictures of the, of the cult here. So it was a, a big team event with, uh, with red hoodies. And that really seems like a cult. Uh, so, um, that's, uh, that's the big thing about Sonarsos. Um, whoops, that's not the slide I wanted. Yeah, there we go. Um, and since 2008, what we do is that we aim at uh, developers. The product we develop is really targeting developers first. Uh, we try to be as simple as we can and we really transparent. The idea is that uh, SonarCube should go into your development process. The products we develop goes into the, the development process, not goes outside of it. Uh, and we try to be as accurate and helpful as we can um, and to, to rebring the, the as much value as we can. The idea being that we are not coming at the end of the day, but we are part of the development ecosystem and part and, uh, and helpful. Uh, we've done that for code quality for a while. And since two years we have started, so we do that through three products, sorry. So uh, one product is SonarLint, which is in the IDE. Uh, SonarCube, you may be very well known as Java, you, as Java developers, you may be very well known what SonarCube is. And SonarCloud is the SaaS version of, uh, the software as a service version of SonarCube, to put it very simply. And so SonarLint is, is the first one with this wiggle, which is a plugin in the IDE to have the same power uh, in your IDE. And uh, since 2018, so about two years ago, we started to apply the principles that are very well known in the world about SonarCube to security. So what we have done for code quality, which is bringing code quality back to developers, we try to apply the same thing to security. So this is a, an ongoing process we have started, uh, which is about how can we actually start to have security audits, which are painful, done by security auditors, which people don't want uh, to discuss with because that's more a pain than help. Uh, so we try to get security back in the hands of developers and we try to apply this principle, which was successful for code quality. And by doing so, we started to um, to do that for uh, actually Java first, because we are first, let's, let's be honest, we are a, a Java shop at first, at heart. Uh, we did that for Java, but we also did that for other languages like um, uh, Python, C Sharp, and also PHP. And when you start to go for um, uh, PHP and detecting vulnerabilities in PHP, you actually get to hear who is on the market there and you start to hear about this small company in Bochum, which is a city that I did not know about before that, uh, this small town in Bochum. And uh, you hear those guys actually are pretty good at detecting vulnerabilities in PHP. And so you start discussing, so, hey, looking at what they are doing, we started to discuss. And at one point uh, there was this acquisition between uh, from SonarSource by, uh, for, this acquisition of Ripstake by SonarSource. <laughs> Let's put it this way. Um, and so it's, uh, it's, uh, it was a nice story like, hey, we get those new guys. They are very good at detecting issues in PHP. They also have some engine regarding Java, JavaScript. And so you start to, to discuss like, so those guys are coming to the company. What are we going to do with what we have, with what they have, and how can we actually build something which is better? So you get all the wishful thinking in the world saying, hey, we are going to take the best of both worlds. And what we are going to try to explain to you tonight is actually that can work. <laughs> so in order to explain this, uh, how we can take two companies, take the technology from two companies, smash them together and get something better, you have to understand what is the the job of static analysis and Malte has the tough challenge to explain that to you in five minutes. So good luck. Thank you. I'm going to try my best. So I just want to give you a little bit of technical background here on static analysis and what this is all about. What, what are we even trying to do here? 
from a technical perspective. And before we start, I, I need to introduce a, a little bit of, of background terminology. So uh, let's start with what we call abstract syntax trees. Um, so abstract syntax trees are basically um, uh, a representation of source code in a, in a tree structure. So you, you, we use this in order to, basically it's a first step if you want to do any kind of analysis, be it code quality or be it uh, security or whatever, you don't want to basically have to pass the text you know, of the source code, but you want to basically first cast this, uh, this source code into a bit more, uh, into a form that is a bit easier to, to analyze. And so an abstract syntax tree basically represents uh, well, uh, some, some piece of source code. So uh, for example, here on the left, you see a little piece of source code that we will see a few times throughout the talk. It's a method called do query. It basically just uh, declares two strings uh, and then it does some operation on operations on these strings and then it calls a method. And if you want to build an abstract syntax tree for this, uh, for this method, then we would basically uh, start out with uh, a node that we call, for example, a method declaration node that would represent a method. This has a few child nodes like uh, uh, a node that represents the name of the method, then a, a node that represents the parameter uh, or the parameters of the method. Uh, then maybe a node that represents a return type, and then maybe a node that uh, will represent uh, the body of the method. And in turn, this node that represents the body of the method, it would contain so one statement, this expression statement that you see on the left, the first one, another one, and uh, then an if statement, and then we get another expression statement and another expression statement. And if you look more closely at the first expression statement, it's actually a very, it, it contains a very, very variable declaration expression, which in turn basically uh, has a type that is being declared, which again ha has, a, is, has a type that is a string in this case, uh, a name that uh, we are assigning to, and a method call uh, expression that basically is what we assign to this variable. And uh, this goes similarly for, for all the rest. So I'm not, I, I don't have to draw the entire abstract syntax tree that would kind of uh, probably explode the slide, but you get, you get the gist. Uh, so this is basically the form that we first want to generate from the source code, and then we work on that. And the first thing that we do with this is we will build a so-called control flow graph. So control flow graph basically allows us to understand in which order uh, sequence uh, or well uh, sequences of statements in the source code are being executed. So in this case, for example, we uh, we get an entry point always for a method. So a control flow graph is always for a method. Uh, and in this case, these two statements will be executed first. So, so for readability, you, here you see the text in that in that uh, control flow graph node, but actually in there you have like AST nodes. Uh, so abstract syntax tree nodes, like I showed you on the previous slide. Um, and then uh, you can either execute this one statement, which is query plus equal fields, or you can execute this other statement, which is query plus equal name. And uh, then both uh, after both statements, we will execute those two uh, statements at the bottom. So this is a very, very simple control flow graph, just to show you how basically those control flow graphs look like. And uh, you might ask, uh, so where's this condition not fields dot empty? And the answer is, uh, it depends. You can model it in a var variety of ways. You could uh, model it, for example, by labeling it, by, by putting it on the edges uh, and labeling the edges with true or false, or you can model it in its own node, or you could also put it as an expression, as a, uh, the last expression of the previous node. But actually in, um, uh, most of the time when we do vulnerability analysis, we're not really interested in the conditions very much because actually most, most of the time this is path insensitive. So we are just interested in exploring all the path, but we're, so, and since we're interested in exploring all the path, we don't really need to know about the conditions. We do need to know maybe sometimes uh, what expressions get executed, but uh, this is just a little side note. Uh, now <clears throat> those uh, control programs, they get, very complex, very quickly. So you don't need to understand this uh, this huge control flow graph here on the right, nor the code on the left. I just want to show you that with very little uh, code, you can generate control flow graphs that start to look very complicated. And this is actually a problem when you want to do uh, vulnerability analysis and when you want to explore all possible paths. And you can see that uh, here it gets uh, very unwieldy. If you want to really explore all the paths, you, you get uh, a lot of paths with only 
a little bit of code. And so you really have to think about how can I do this in a performant way so that I can really explore all the path through the program in order to find uh, any kind of vulnerability that could reside in any in, in any of those paths um, while still, while still uh, yielding an acceptable performance for the user. And we're going to talk about that challenge. Um, and next, uh, once we have those control flow graphs, what we do is what we call taint analysis. So a taint analysis uh, works as follows. Um, we have what we call a source. So this is the first statement in this case. And this is usually just uh, some statement where you read some input from the user. So this is something where an attacker could actually inject the content of a variable. So for example, it could be if you have a web application, it could be a get parameter or post parameter or something like that, something that you read from the attacker and that then will flow through through your program. And uh, when, when we have such a source, so here for simplicity, we just call it source, just some attacker controlled input. We say that this variable is tainted, which you can basically see because now I, I tainted these uh, variables in red. And um, on the other hand, you also have variables that are not tainted. So here you have, for example, a static string. So this is something that's not tainted, it's safe. Uh, no problem there. This is not something that the attacker can control. And then we start to uh, go through this control flow graph and uh, we start tainting variables. So when we meet this statement on the left of the control flow graph, um, here, actually, we don't know what fields is. Uh, so it could be tainted, it could not be tainted. It depends very much on what the parameter uh, fields is. So for now, we don't know, so I, I labeled it in blue. And we're going to talk about this problem as well in a second. Um, but uh, for now, let's continue. Uh, here on the left, again, we uh, add something to this query variable, which is again, safe. So again, query is still not tainted. And now uh, when we get back to this, uh, to this a bottom node on in the control flow graph. Then we actually uh, are concatenating two nodes, one which is untainted and the other one which is tainted. So this is ID variable. So basically we propagate the taint to this query variable. And now what happens is uh, that the last statement here is what we call a sync. Uh, and a sync is some kind of sensitive operation in your program. And you usually don't want uh, an attacker to be able to control the input to that function, because then the attacker might be might be able to do something malicious. And in this case, uh, since the variable query is tainted, that means that the attacker can actually reach with his input uh, this, this sensitive operation. And therefore we would say that there is a vulnerability. Now there are a few edge cases, of course, where we don't want to say that this is a vulnerability and we're going to talk about that, but this is just a base principle. Uh, so essentially we're always trying to detect um, any kind of path through the program where an attacker can inject input that then will flow into some sensitive operation. And in order to do that, we do this taint analysis. And this looks still very simple when you consider this uh, one method example here, but usually when you look at real world vulnerabilities, they span over multiple methods and they are much more complex and, and they don't just involve a single method in your program. So uh, let's look at a slightly more complicated example that now involves two methods. So here we have now this method uh, foo on the right. Again, we have the source. So this fields variable here is tainted. So this argument to do query here is tainted. So we know now that the parameter here of this do query function is tainted. This time ID is something untainted. So it's safe, query is safe. And now we add uh, fields. So this tainted parameter to query. So now we know it's tainted. On the right hand side, the query is not tainted, but still that means that overall, when you get to the bottom uh, control flow node, uh, query will be tainted, even though here we are only adding safe stuff, but query is already tainted because of the left side of the control flow graph. So again, we reach the sync with a tainted variable and therefore we will raise a vulnerability. And now the, the problem uh, that you might see surfacing here is that if you want to do an analysis like this, you not only have to go through all possible path uh, of a control flow graph in a single method, but you also have to basically traverse the entire call graph and consider every possible way in which functions could call each other. So method A can call method B and method C, method B can call method D, E, F, and you basically, you get a huge graph and that this completely explodes. And again, you get a performance problem and you have to think about how can we do this in a performant manner so that we can kind of 
detect all possible paths through the program, not only through a single method, but even but even interprocedurally. And uh, we're going to talk about those challenges and how we tackle them. Um, but this is everything that I wanted to tell you about the basics of taint analysis for now. And uh, I guess Nico is going to continue. Cool. Thank you, uh, Malte, for this quick introduction. So now that uh, everyone in the room, uh, in the virtual room, knows everything about static analysis, uh, don't forget that Sonar Source is recruiting. So you're welcome to send your CV, given that you are now completely uh, uh, skilled for that. Uh, so uh, what we are going to talk about is the recipe between beer and fondue. So when we prepared it to this talk, we realized and we learned that uh, beer fondue is actually a thing. It's uh, it's a recipe. I never tried it my, myself. Uh, but uh, we mixed uh, the best of Germany and the best of Switzerland in order, in order to get something even better. And I will assume beer fondue is better, huh? but... Uh, um, uh, but we'll see. Um, so, how did we do things on the fondue side uh, when before Rips uh, joined the party? Um, oops, what the heck? Okay, every time it seems to glitch a bit. Never mind. So, on the fondue side, how did we things the? How did we do things the sonar source way? Uh, so, <clears throat> we had this idea that. Doing taint analysis is not an easy task. So what we had in mind was to say, we want to, we don't want to do that for every single language. We want to do that this kind of analysis in one way, and in order to do so, we need to abstract things away uh, to an intermediary format uh, that will do the analysis that we will do the analysis on top of and try to not repeat some implementation of analysis. It, we reached this conclusion because we did another kind of analysis which was not taint and we faced the problem of actually having to do that in every single language. One thing we have to understand here is that uh, control flow graph CFGs are uh, language dependent most of the time in their implementation. So what we have is that uh, the, the, um, the CFGs are usually using apps, uh, bits of um, of the abstract syntax tree in order to get the nodes of this uh, of this flow graph and so for each language you have a different cfg so if you are to do a taint analysis on top of those cfg you will have to adapt to every single syntax of the different languages and we didn't want to do that because we faced the problem for some other kind of uh, of analysis and we wanted to avoid this so what we went for was to say hey hold on we can probably go for something which is more uh, abstract in a way with only the relevant information for taint analysis, and we call that universal control flow graph. So, in short, UCFG. I'm going to talk a lot about UCFG, which is the intermediate representation between uh, the language itself and uh, um, the um, and the analysis. Uh, the idea is that you compile all those uh, CFG that are language dependent into a language independent format. So you can actually start to work on your analysis with a format which is abstracted away from the syntax details. Uh, what does that UCFG contain? Uh, well, it's fairly short. Huh? It's representing the, the graph of, uh, of instructions. Uh, basically, it's, it's composed of uh, about four instructions. I'm going, uh, I'm oversimplifying a bit here, but that's, uh, that's enough. We represent everything with uh, assignment and method calls. Uh, so, uh, for instance, when you have concatenation of string, it's uh, this special method which we call concat. When you have a simple assignment, it's this special call to ID. And when you have standard calls in your program, we have those virtual calls, uh, vcall, which we call vcall, to some methods. And we assign that to a variable and we pass the information there. And so that's what the UCFG contains, this and a few um, also uh, instructions to represent the flow. So we have this block of instructions, we jump to that block of instructions, that's, that's it. We also store for reporting purposes the localization of those instructions back in original the source code. So that means that, hey, this concatenation actually happens at, in this file at this line because that's quite convenient that when you report a vulnerability, we actually tell you where it is. Otherwise, that would be really not so uh, so easy to find out uh, what is the 
what is the vulnerability and the a reporting from a, from a static analysis tool which would say uh, hey here is a vulnerability good luck to find where it is it would not be really convenient and so in, in short that's that's the information contained in UCSG it's a really big abstraction of the code we remove a lot of information that are not useful for data analysis and finding vulnerabilities in order to simplify the, the implementation of, uh, of the analysis so that's the basis of our work. And on top of that, at Sonar Source, what we did was to implement fixed point analysis. So I'm going to explain why it's called fixed point in, in, a, in a minute. Uh, the first few steps that I want to detail are how we start to work with UCFG. So you have this bunch of UCFG, which are the, the cube on the left here, and we start to build what we call a call graph. So on those UCFG, it's uh, for, we build one UCFG per method, which is something I maybe not have precise. So for each method, we build one UCFG, and then you have to connect all those UCFGs depending on which method is calling which one. And this is the core graph. So we build it. Uh, it's not always so straightforward. For instance, uh, one problem uh, you can think of is about polymorphism and interface. When you have a method that is called on an interface, uh, which UCFG is called actually. So that's one of the problems you have to face when uh, dealing with the call graph. So we have a bunch of things going on here, which I'm not going to go into too much detail, otherwise this talk will last five hours. Uh, so we solve all this, we have a call graph which is good enough to us, let's say. And then we actually explode this call graph, which means like, so we were connecting UCFGs. And now we are actually connecting all the instructions all together based on that. So when you call this method, actually, you can think about we are linking this instruction to the next one, which is the first one of the next method. So this is what we get. Uh, and, and from that, we get the location graph. So for every single location instruction in the CFG, we actually uh, start to conceptualize this huge location graph. So you can imagine that's quite a big one. And for every single location in that location graph, we actually annotate that with a memory state, which will store the information about the program. So what do we have in this memory state? In the short, and again, I'm oversimplifying a lot here because there is a lot of problems I'm not even evoking. <laughs> but in short, in this memory state, we are storing the state of, uh, of every single variable uh, in UCFG. So we saw the fact that, hey, is this variable actually tainted? Is it not tainted? Is it maybe tainted and not tainted? So for instance, on the example of the field uh, that Malte used in the static analysis introduction, uh, you can have two paths where, I mean, at the end of these two paths, uh, the at this location, the variable can have been both tainted and not tainted. And the next uh, step, uh, the, 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 the next state of variable that we can store is like, hey, actually, we have no idea. That can happen. So in the memory state, we store this kind of information. Again, oversimplifying a lot here, there is a huge load of problems that are um, not mentioned, but the principle is there. And what we are going to do then is like, based on this annotation graph, we are starting, we are going to start uh, to implement transformation. So this big blue box uh, with very simple rules. Uh, and we are going to propagate new information we learned over this graph. So what we're going to do is to say like, okay, from this instruction var zero equals source, we have this memory state where actually the variable zero is not tainted. And the transformation rules tells us that, well, because of this assignment of a source to this variable, then variable zero will be tainted. So we generate a new state and we actually propagate this new information to the next location. So that's the last line propagation to next instruction here on the screen. And what we get out of that is like, hey, actually on this next location, has the state changed or not? If the state has changed, well, we apply the transformation to this new memory state and we carry on like that. And so we are going to go over this huge graph multiple times, apply the transformation, and we're going to do that until we actually learn nothing new. Uh, and we are by construction and by design of this uh, analysis actually, and there is a fairly load of uh, really funny mathematics that can make you look very smart in uh, in, uh, in fancy dinners. Uh, you can talk about lattice and uh, bounded lattice, which makes you look really smart. Uh, there is a lot of maths involved here, which guarantees you that this is going to finish. 
does not guarantee you the time it's going to be finished off, which is a very important nuance, but it's going to finish at one point. Uh, and the idea is that we, we do this simple transformation all over this big graph, and when we actually can't transform anything more, we can stop and look at, hey, do we actually have one point in this graph where we have a source uh, that painted something and that actually make uh, that reach uh, a sink so we have a vulnerability. So that's what we have implemented uh, on the on the sonar source side. And I'm going to, so on the fondue side, and I'm going to let Malte explain how they did, how they did things in Germany. Yes, so I'm going to explain to you the, the beer side of the th things. So um, uh, what we did, uh, so as you see, it's, it's it looks fairly similar at the beginning. We have some PHP code, Java code, uh, whatever, some, some, some code that we transform into ASTs and then CFGs, as I explained before. But as opposed to what Sonar Source did, um, we actually did not create those u universal CFGs, those use CFGs. So basically we had to implement uh, an analysis for each of the CFGs over and over again for each language that we wanted to analyze. Um, we actually, back then we thought that uh, this would be a, a cool idea to do it like this because then we could like have an, a specific engine that is really fine-tuned towards the uh, idiosyncrasies of each language. Um, but it turns out that uh, while it sounds nice in, in theory, it just involves a lot of work because uh, you have to implement the engine over and over again, completely from scratch for each possible CFG for each language. And it actually, in practice, it just doesn't give you uh, an advantage. So as long as your uh, intermediate representation, such as the UCFGs uh, that they had at Sonos was is powerful enough and good enough to represent everything that you want to model in the language, then you can find all the vulnerabilities. So in the end, you're just getting a, a buttload of work if you, if you implement this over and over again without any advantages. Now, the analysis that we had uh, was uh, not the fixed point analysis that uh, Nico just told you about, but uh, we had another one that we called symbolic analysis. And this one is actually really cool because it's really precise and it's something that resulted from the uh, research, uh, research that our uh, founder, Johannes, did uh, during his PhD thesis. And uh, it's basically built on that uh, original engine which analyzed uh, PHP code. And you can also map those algorithms to any other language. Um, <clears throat> so now we thought about how can we uh, basically get the best out of those both worlds and how can we uh, fusion <laughs> uh, our, our, our two engines and how can we, how can we basically uh, get, get all everything that's good uh, on the sonar source side and everything that's good on the rip side and kind of merge it together and come up with the greatest engine ever. And uh, the answer is, uh, it's very simple actually. So we said, okay, let's use those UCFGs that already exist at, at sonar source because they are really cool. And uh, you're going to see why also in a, in a second. So Nico is going to tell you about another advantage of those UCFGs. Um, and so we are going to use the symbolic analysis that we have at RIPS because it performs slightly better. Uh, so it's, it's slightly more precise. It has, uh, it has less false positives and it, it's a really cool analysis. So basically what we, what we did is, uh, let's, okay, let's implement one more symbolic analysis engine. We already did it four times. So why not do it the fifth time? At this time, let's do it on top of the UCFGs. And then we have, uh, we have a really cool combination of those two, of those two technologies. So basically in a nutshell, uh, this is something that already existed at Sonar Source. So transforming Java and C Sharp and Python PHP code into UCFGs. Then uh, for JavaScript code, this did not exist yet because this is not something that Sonar Source previously supported. So transforming JavaScript code into uh, UCFGs is something that uh, we started doing now and we are currently working on that. And um, what we're going to talk about now is a little bit more about the UCFG. So Nico is going to tell you about some cool uh, features and improvements that we get out of them. And then after that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what the symbolic analysis is all about. And, uh, and one thing that is uh, to be understood here, which is uh, quite amazing is that we took one piece of technology from one company, another piece of technology from another company and plugged them together and that worked which was not a given at start time, let's be honest here. Uh, 
one thing which is really nice, and I want to yeah to share this little anecdote somewhat, uh, how actually you have to get people working two years in order to solve a big problem in ten minutes, uh, is about UCFGs and the live variable analysis. So. First thing first, what is live variable analysis? Live variable analysis is just, um, um, and I'm going to talk about LVA a lot huh, for short. Um, this is a well-known uh, technique in compilers to be able to drop information that are not relevant uh, specifically for uh, assigning uh, memories. So um, uh, live variable analysis uh, in short is that uh, the algorithm is pretty simple and pretty fun, but in short, you start from the top, from the bottom of the method, and you walk your way up uh, towards the beginning, and you start with the assumption that hey, here from the bottom of the method, you know that you won't use any more any local variables. So basically, we say all variables here are dead. When you walk up, you say hey, actually x x is red here, so I'm gonna until this point, I'm gonna be I'm gonna need x variable to be live because I'm going to read it here. So this transformation, you apply that to this point. So X is red, so um, so, the, so X is live. When you woke up, you have some assignments here. So you know that, you know, from this point on, X is actually dead because it's not red anymore and it's a sign. So the value actually is, actually, is used there. So X is considered dead here. And same goes for Y, which is like, hey, from this point on, Y is red, so Y is live. So that means, from the last from the, for the for the last part of the method you have no need to store actually any information regarding the state of the variable y because actually you don't need it uh, and and this is something that you can learn fairly easily this live variable analysis is a fairly simple uh, it, it's actually really nice. It sounds a bit smart, but it's not that hard to implement. And it's, uh, it's really well known and well documented. So we implemented that uh, for actually uh, PHP um, because we realized that we had some, uh, some issues with, um, uh, with PHP uh, specifically, where we had a lot of information that can be stored. And in fixed point analysis, it was even more um, uh, prevalent to not store all the information and to um, to be able to uh, to move things around, because um, when you are dealing with fixed points, the less information you have to store, the less fixed points you can actually get. Um, uh, the, the the faster you can reach the fixed point analysis. So the um, the main idea here about live variable analysis was to say, okay, let's not store all these informations. Let's try to just store only what we need, and uh, for and with this we we manage to actually reach. A point uh, where um, where we improved, uh, I think we improved the performance by by around thirty percent on the fixed point analysis, and specifically for PHP because PHP uh, it was really really uh, really prevalent into into this language. Probably a lot of local variables analysis, so we were really going faster with live variable analysis, um, and. One, and the anecdote is that at one point, um, Malte did this effort to go and plug the symbolic analysis on top of UCFG. It was already working well, but the performances were okay, but not so great. And we started to discuss, and I discussed with him about this. I remember actually that it took, uh, it was actually a really fast conversation. It was like, hey, hold, hold on. We have this live variable analysis thing, which is implemented. We have the, the information readily available. And we can actually drop some information there. And if I'm correct and I understand how symbolic analysis work, that means you are probably storing information way longer than actually what you need. So you could probably drop that at some point. So Malte thought about that for a full minute, I think, uh, and said something like, yeah, actually, you're right. We can probably try that. So we tried it out, all test green and we dropped the performance again by 30% on, uh, on some Java code. So we are actually pretty excited about that because uh, in in a matter of 10 minutes, we managed to actually get those this innovation from one side, plugged into some new technology from this uh, over company. And that was actually really, really a cool anecdote here about like, hey, that's really nice. <laughs> yeah. Indeed, it's amazing how well the combining of those two technologies worked. Uh always happy when I think about this. Um, 
And yeah, indeed, I can confirm that uh, this new symbolic analysis engine with the LVA analysis was way faster than all the four symbolic analysis engines that we had before. So that was a really, really cool thing. Okay, now uh, I'm going to tell you about what this uh, famous symbolic analysis that we've been talking about all this time is. Um, so symbolic analysis is based on what we call symbols. Um, and what is a symbol? A symbol is the, basically it's a representation of all the states that a value may take at any particular point in the program. So for example, uh, here we have a parameter and for that we would generate a parameter symbol. So it's something that comes from the outside and we do not, we basically don't know anything about it. It's a parameter symbol, it's unknown. Um, if we have something that is calling a source, as in this case, then we will generate a taint source symbol. So this is, so this will symbolize something that basically comes from a source and it could potentially be malicious. Uh, here we have some string declarations and for that we will generate so-called string literal symbols that can just take a single string. Um, or here in this example, for example, we concatenate basically something that was a string with a parameter. So basically we have a concatenation of a string symbol and a parameter symbol. And for that we have a concatenation symbol. So basically concatenation symbols con con contain a list of symbols of other symbols, basically that are chained up one after the other. And there are a few more uh, symbols. There are maybe uh, a dozen or even a bit more, maybe two dozen. Um, and I'm not going to go into all the, all the detail here. Uh, it's just to give you the idea, basically. We, we, try, we try to kind of uh, represent everything that's happening in the program via these symbols. Um, so now there are two questions that we can ask. So first, how basically can we obtain this information? How can we propagate this, this information to, to, to the variables? So which symbols do we generate where? And another very interesting question is what happens at the merging point? So basically here in this case, for example, we do something with this variable query, but query, depending on where it comes from, whether it comes from the left side or the right side of the control flow graph, the, uh, there are two different possible symbols here. So, so basically what do we do at that point? Uh, because kind of there are, then here at that point, there's more than one possible state for this variable. And the answer to, to, uh, to this is basically what we call the simulation. So what we do is um, we basically simulate. Uh, so for every method that we encounter in the program, we will, we will start a so-called simulation. And uh, this means that we basically go through it step by step. So for example, here's the first step. Uh, we look at the method, we see, okay, there's a parameter called fields. So we will generate a parameter symbol for it and store it kind of in the current uh, 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 um, store of local variables that we have. Um, then here we have this assignment uh, from source to this variable ID. So we'll generate a taint source symbol and assign it to this variable ID. Then we have this query uh, variable that is being assigned a string uh, literal symbol. So it's kind of like executing the program actually. Uh, and on the, then we continue to travel along the control flow graph on the, and we will say, okay, on the left-hand side here, now we have to generate a concatenation symbol of whatever the variable was before. So namely the string literal symbol, which contains select and the parameter symbol, which is being attached here. And on the right, well, we also have a concatenation symbol, except that it's a concatenation symbol of two string literal symbols. So as an optimization, we can just kind of squeeze that together into a single string literal symbol, which will contain the string select name. So we do that. Um, now here at this merging, uh, basically when, when we basically go now to the bottom of the control flow graph, what we do is we will generate a so-called union symbol. So a union symbol can contain a, a set of possible symbols. It's kind of similar to, uh, if you're familiar with static single assignment form, um, to the phi function. It's, it's basically just tells you that uh, it could be either one of those values. And there could be more than two values, of course. So in this case, we know that query is either a concatenation symbol of a string literal symbol and a parameter symbol, or just uh, this other string literal symbol. And um, for each, basically for each um, block that we have in the, in the CFG, we store the, the state of the local variables in that, in that block, and we call that a block summary. Uh, so in this case, here in, in, in the block summary of the last uh, of, the, of the last uh, block, 
after we merged this, uh, after we did this merging for the for query, we execute this this statement here, uh, which basically attaches yet another string and uh, this uh, variable ID, which is a taint source symbol at the end of, of this union symbol. And basically we factorize that in. So now we get a union symbol of two concatenation symbols, one of which is a concatenation of a string, a parameter, another string and a taint source symbol, interestingly, and another one, which is a concatenation of this fixed string select name from na 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 and a taint source symbol. So we know that it's either of those two things. Um, <clears throat> and this is what we store in the block summary of the last block, along with also what is the variable fields and what is the variable ID, uh, which is not depicted here for, for space reasons, but essentially in each block, we have the information what all the variables in that block are. And finally, we meet our sync. And uh, when we meet the sync, uh, we can look at what the argument is. And here in this case, the argument is just this uh, variable named query. And we can look up, okay, what is what is query? So we see, okay, it's this union symbol, which contains kind of these two concatenation symbols, which in turn contain taint source symbols, which means that basically uh, we are we have reached this, the sync, as I told you before, with a variable that is kind of, that is somehow tainted because it contains those taint source symbols. And so therefore we will raise a vulnerability. So it's basically what, what I told you before in this uh, static analysis in five minutes, try to detect kind of, uh, are, is it possible that the taint reaches, reaches the sink? And this is exactly what we do with this, uh, uh, with the symbolic analysis here, basically. So as long as uh, anything reaches the sink that contains somehow taint source symbols, we will raise a vulnerability in most cases, except uh, in a few cases that I will tell you about in the end, but that's the principle. Um, now I told you before that um, you have to do this in, a, in an efficient manner somehow, because, uh, well, because because there are seven, many possible paths through a program and there are also many possible paths that method could call it, methods could call each other. So um in order to kind of optimize this we build what we call method summaries so method summaries are just uh, small uh, pieces of information that kind of tell us what a method can potentially do what its side effects are what it possible what its possible possible return values are and uh, actually whenever we uh, encounter method call expression during simulation we will only simulate that method the first time that we meet uh, basically this call expression and uh, we did we don't know that method yet we then simulate that method uh, as I told as I, as I showed you before with the simulation and using that simulation we build what we call a method summary and now every time that the method will be called again at later points in the code when we by we continue our simulation we will not look at this method again we'll just use the method summary in order to apply basically what the method does to our current current context and kind of understand what's happening. And this works recursively. So what does a method summary look like? Well, here on the left, you have this uh, very simple method. It assigns something to p.x, namely a, a string, hello world. So you can see that a side effect on the right here, you can see that the side effect of this method would be that it assigns to uh, p.x the, the string literal symbol, hello world. So, and also the left is also represented as a symbol. So this is a field access symbol that contains a parameter symbol and this, this name X. And uh, the return value of this method is either 42 or 123. So basically uh, during simulation, we will have built uh, for the return value, a, a union symbol of two primitive, uh, two primitive value symbols. Uh, which contain either 42 or 123. So that is basically our summary of the method. We, we know it has one side effect, assigns something to p.x and we know what, and uh, we know that it returns one of two values. And this is, this is all we need to know for our analysis. Uh, and so basically once we've simulated it, we will never simulate it again. And that is really nice because that means that since each summary is computed only once, uh, the running time of our analysis is actually li linear in the number of methods. So, because we simulate each method once, and once we have simulated every method, basically we are done. Uh, now, how does this work? It sounds very nice in, in, in theory, but uh, in practice, uh, you could imagine that this could be complex. So um, let me depict, depict this with a small example. This is again our do query function, but this time we've built it up in a kind of uh, interprocedural way. 
So um, the interesting point here is, is this. We have this uh, query object that's being initialized uh, via a constructor, new builder. And uh, this builder uh, constructor, it does the following. Uh, it, it kind of, it has one side effect, which is it kind of affects the current object or the new object that it creates. And it uh, assigns to the field save SQL some string. So it's a string literal symbol in this case. And then it will uh, also assign something to this other field, this.sql, depending on what this parameter fields look like, looks like exactly. So this is pretty similar to what we had before, actually. Um, and so our, uh, our the summary of, of the builder will look like this. Uh, we have some side effects, namely uh, either, uh, or well, we have two side effects. Uh, the one is that this dot save SQL is being assigned a string literal symbol, which contains this select star from you. And the other is that uh, it um, we assign to the variable this dot SQL a union symbol, which contains two concatenation symbols. Again, one which contains a string a string symbol, a parameter symbol, another string symbol, and a parameter symbol. And the other one contains a concatenation of just a string symbol and a parameter symbol. So this is basically the possible side effects that this method uh, can have. And uh, I'm saying method, even though it's a constructor, because actually we, uh, we will consider during our simulation, this constructor like a method that basically just has some side effects on a virtual parameter, this that we, are, that we pass to it. So basically, uh, what happens is that when we uh, create this query object in the in the caller context, we will kind of create a new object symbol, and then we will just uh, pass this object symbol as an argument to, uh, or kind of, <clears throat> we will basically uh, apply the side effects that this method summary has to this newly created object symbol. So we know that this corresponds the or anything that is uh, that corresponds to this is a side effect on the object symbol that we just created. And uh, there could also be, of course, uh, side effects to the parameters, but we're not going to talk about that for simplicity. Um, but uh, applying the side effects uh, of or to the this value, uh, i.e. to the uh, query object symbol that we created in the caller context, means that now here at this point, we actually get uh, an object symbol that has two fields, one which is uh, safe SQL. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, one which is safe SQL, uh, which contains the string symbol, and the other one uh, is SQL, which contains this union symbol of two concatenation symbols, which contain again those taint source symbols. And so now, when we continue evaluating, so we again meet a sync, and now we what, what the argument to the sync is query dot SQL. So since query is an object symbol, we can look inside it. And uh, we can look at what is the state of the of the field SQL here, and we see okay, this is a union symbol that contains somehow nested deep down some taint symbols, and so therefore we will raise a vulnerability. Whereas uh, in the next occasion when we call db.query and we pass query dot save SQL, uh, we we see we can look inside the object symbol and we see okay here it, this is actually a string literal symbol. And this is safe. There's no taint source uh, symbol going on here. So we don't have to raise a vulnerability here. So this is a really nice feature that this means that we actually support what we call field sensitivity, basically. So uh, we we don't just consider query, the object query as, as completely tainted here, just because the object symbol contains some taint source symbols, but we can actually look inside the, the, the object symbol and uh, decide precisely whether uh, some particular field is being tainted or not. So this avoids a lot of false positives. And uh, yeah, that was it for the basics on symbolic analysis. And Nico is going to tell you what this is good for. Uh, I will let you click, Monte. So, okay, this is really uh, great yeah. stuff. Um, but what, why do we actually need this? Uh, what is it good for? Um, well, it's not just theoretical here. Uh, I wanted to show you this one, which is uh, an issue that we find thanks to this uh, to this kind of analysis. We found this issue onto uh, Tomcat 9. It has been fixed already, so uh, no worries here. It's a responsible uh, disclosure. Uh, 
Uh, but we are able to detect this kind of, uh, of vulnerability which have made their way into CVE. So common, uh, common vulnerability enumeration. So this is a, well, a, known, um, a known attack. So it's, uh, it's an XS test, if I'm correct, this one, um, which actually takes some user input and you can actually uh, re-inject that back to the user. So some hackers can do some stuff in order to get things from the server here. So um, you have everything you need in the SonarCube interface to, in order to get a bit where this variable, where this value will actually flow. So we get some uh, string from the from the request actually, so we can actually forge something here. And then this value is actually going to navigate through the through the flow of the program in different in different methods, different objects back and forth. And then at one point it will be returned into some uh, some writer that has a, that is going to be reflected back to the user, and that's where it is actually an issue. And so all what Mante described here, we are able to actually uh, manage to find this issue thanks to that, uh, where we are able to track this tainted value through the through the course of the program. Uh, and so here we have this example of an XSS, but there is multiple different uh, vulnerabilities out there we, which we can find because. This principle applies to a lot of different vulnerabilities where you have uh, some uh, user in, some input that is that can be controlled by an external user and some uh, sensitive operations that you don't want external user input to reach. And so we can detect this kind of issue thanks to this technology. And that's it. But it doesn't stop there, right? It does not stop there. So uh, yeah, um, last but not least, I will tell you, tell you about another cool feature that um, does not exist in Sonar, Sonar Cube yet. So it, it hasn't been implemented yet in our new uh, symbolic analysis engine for the UCFGs, but it was implemented in uh, the PHP engine uh, back in the old days at RIPS and also in the Java engine at RIPS. And it's something that allows us to be even more precise. So it's, uh, I told you before about this field sensitivity that we have, which allows us to look inside objects instead of just considering some object as tainted and then just raising a vulnerability whenever something from that object flows into a sink. Um, this is uh, now even more involved and it's something that is going to come soon to SonarCube uh, in sometime during the course of uh, next year. So uh, it's something that we call markup sensitivity. And um, now look at this piece of code. Uh, this is actually uh, safe because, uh, okay, here we have a source as, um, as I've told you uh, about before. And here we have a sync. Uh, and this variable query, some, somehow it, uh, as you can see, it includes this variable ID. And so therefore you would expect that we will raise a vulnerability because we actually uh, kind of the, the attacker input kind of reaches the sink. Except that if you look at this now, uh, actually this looks pretty safe because here we have this uh, sanitizer, escape quotes that is being applied to this variable ID. And then afterwards, uh, so, so basically this escape quotes as the name suggests, right? It, it strips the quotes somehow from the user input or it, it escapes them or whatever. So there can be no quotes in there, at least no, no unescaped quotes. And then this is this string, this modified string is embedded into a SQL query uh, inside some quotes. So the attacker cannot really um, do anything harmful here. He could just modify the ID that is being injected in this uh, SQL query, but uh, he could not kind of uh, modify the SQL query in order to do anything harmful to your database, for example. Um, now, therefore, here we do not have a vulnerability. So we don't want to raise a vulnerability in this case. And uh, if done naively, we could just say, okay, we consider that escape quotes is a sanitizer. We can just kind of tell our engine, look, escape quotes is what we call a sanitizer. And uh, please, uh, if this variable ID goes through somehow a sanitizer and then is embedded into a sink, then don't raise a vulnerability, right? And so this is what uh, most engines uh, on, the, on, the, on the market do. Uh, but uh, now consider this, uh, this slightly modified piece of code. Uh, I'm going back one more time. You see this is safe. This is unsafe. The only uh, difference here between the two is that when we build the markup of this query, now this variable ID is not embedded in quotes anymore. So we still have the sanitizer, but this variable ID is not embedded in quotes anymore. 
So that means that, in fact, the sanitizer is not sufficient anymore in this context, because now the attacker doesn't need to embed quotes in this uh, in this input in order to escape the query and do something malicious. So, for example, consider the case where the attacker now submits just as input foo semicolon drop table u. So now you get a valid SQL query uh, and it could potentially harm your database. And this, even though there was a sanitizer that sanitized the input, it was just that the sanitizer was not sufficient. And the reason that it was not sufficient was just because of the markup that the, that the query was made of. Uh, so we, we have to have a look at the, at the markup of the query, in fact, you know, if we want to be really precise and uh, be able to tell that this is a vulnerability, even though there is a sanitizer. Um, so yeah, we want to say that there is a vulnerability. So how do we do this? Um, well, that's uh, actually not very complicated if you consider how the symbolic analysis works and how it can, how it is able to reconstruct things, uh, strings with these string literal symbols and these concatenation symbols that, that I showed you before. So when we reach the sync and uh, we, we look at this uh, variable query here, we will look at, okay, what is the symbol currently for this variable query? So it's a concatenation symbol of a string symbol and a chain source symbol. Uh, sure, great. Uh, so now what we can do before we raise a vulnerability uh, is we can create a string representation of that. So we will just replace the chain source symbol with some random uh, user input, or we'll just call it user input and uh, underscore one, because potentially there could be more than one user input there, right? So we want to identify which uh, which of these user input strings that we generate corresponds to which chain source symbol. And then we get a valid SQL query and we can use uh, just a normal SQL parser in order to compute actually an abstract syntax tree of the SQL query, which kind of will decomp decompose the SQL query into parts. And then we can look at this part that contains the, the user input and we can see, ah, actually the user input here is used, uh, is, is being embedded into the SQL query without quotes. Now, when we consider a sync for uh, SQL injection, uh, for, for SQL injections, actually we differentiate between uh, three different subtypes of vulnerabilities that could arise, namely SQL injections with double quotes, SQL injections with single quotes, and SQL injections with no quotes. Um, and uh, when we when we look at this sync and uh, we see on the right hand side that the identifier here is being used without quotes uh, instead of in single quotes or instead of in double quotes, then what we want is a sanitization for this particular subtype SQL I with no quotes. Uh, on the other hand, we also know that escape quotes, this function is uh, a sanitizer, but not in general for SQL I, but only for the subtypes SQL I with single quotes and SQL I with double quotes. So in other words, we don't have a match here. We, we require sanitization for SQL I with no quotes, and we only have a sanitization for SQL I with single quotes and with double quotes. So therefore we would raise a vulnerability in this case, even though there is a sanitizer by, by looking at the markup. And so just uh, to show you the analogous case, if we look at the safe code here, where this is embedded into in, in, in double quotes, for example, we look at this uh, symbol, we have a concatenation symbol again, that looks now a bit differently because we have these quotes around the taint source symbol. We again compute this uh, abstract syntax tree as I showed you before, and then we can see, okay, this identifier here, this time it's being used with quotes. So what we require is a SQL I uh, double quote sanitization, and we have a sanitizer that does uh, sanitize against double quotes uh, in the case of SQL I. So therefore, uh, no vulnerability is raised in this case. And of course, this works uh, not only for SQL I, but uh, so SQL, SQL I is, is a nice example to show this, but uh, this can become arbitrarily complex. So for example, in the case of XSS, it really depends on, are you embedding the input inside the, uh, or inside a tag, inside an attribute name, inside an attribute value, maybe inside even a script tag. So there you would need some sanitization against JavaScript or just as, uh, as, as, as a DOM node. So in this case, you, you need some sanitization against so that the attacker cannot inject tags and so on. Um, and so, yeah, that is what we call markup sensitivity and it is coming to our new, uh, UCFG engine at Sonar source very soon. And uh, yeah, that was it from us. 
And uh, if you have any questions, we're happy to take them. Yes. Um, and uh, I do hope that you managed to follow all this. So, uh, so thank you very much for the attention here. Thank you. Great, thank you for the presentation. I found it's quite interesting. Um, obviously, there are now coming questions in, for sure. We have already three in the list. I want to ask you one specific question, which I think is quite important, like for everyone here in the room. Does this new feature also come into Sonar Cube, which is a community edition? Nope. <laughs> That's a very good question. No, it's not part of the community edition. It's part. It starts with the developer edition. Uh, which is indeed a paying. Uh, this is a paying feature. This is a clo one uh, one of the few parts which are closed source into the Sonar source offering. So uh, this engine is not uh, open source, uh, but we wanted to share a bit how we can find vulnerabilities. And uh, and I think uh, technically the algorithm is really really interesting for developers. Uh, so indeed it's not it's not part of the community edition. You have to start with a developer edition in order to. Uh, Okay. to benefit from this uh, advanced vulnerability. But we do have a finding of some vulnerabilities uh, in the community edition though. Okay, there is still like some, some small things or maybe there are more things coming in the future. Uh, yeah, you can have some, you can find some vulnerabilities in the community edition. We, you, it won't trigger the algorithms we described. That's just okay. to be clear. Okay. This engine is part of the next video of the of the upper editions. Um, another question which came to my mind because you are we are talking about graphs and so on. Have you built your own um, graph database or like is that something which is very uh, proprietary to your needs or like uh, how how do you like build up these these graphs? Like or yeah. So um, no, we don't have a, we don't have a specific graph database for that. We uh, basically just uh, implemented our own graph representation that suits our needs uh, inside our code base. Okay, and this allows us to basically uh, just have the the bare minimum what we need and and be as efficient as possible. So that means like there is um, just like you have the the object graph and then you go through that through it like with your algorithms and there is no possibility to query other things which might be interesting as well. The, the possibility to what? Sorry, you you don't have a possibility to query like this um, USC no. graph. No, as, as of today, we don't really build and store um, call graphs or things like that. We build them analysis to analysis. It's quite fast. So as of today, we don't really have a need to cache things out uh, okay. in the database or whatever the format. We build this in memory and we work with this in memory. It's, it's quite interesting that you would ask this because during my PhD thesis, as I said, I actually worked on, on um, vulnerability detection as well. And there, indeed, I did store some of these uh, objects like call graphs and stuff like that, or control flow graphs in, in graph databases. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, it's, it's not in practice, it's not faster than, than what we have here. So okay. <laughs> I, I, I like think it was for our case. <laughs> yeah. I'm just asking, we have a talk coming up on the 16th of February where we have like the, the colleagues from, um, JQ assistant, which will talk about like how you can actually like browse through the code and do some um, checks and so on. And this is like quite similar. I mean, not exactly the same, but also like some static code analysis and that tool uses behind a graph database. But anyhow, let's go to the questions um, which are already in the list. So um, Steven was asking already uh, a while ago and he said, um, if you actually do your analysis, you know what this means, right? <laughs> so, uh, and uh, I don't know how much of it was a joke or not. <laughs> Uh, but for JavaScript, indeed, that means we have to solve the problem of to understand. I, I think it was for JavaScript, right? To understand yeah. what this is in JavaScript. And we have to solve that problem. And indeed, uh, JavaScript is quite a beast. Uh, it's quite a challenge for, uh, for, study, for, uh, for tend analysis. Um, uh, just to be clear, I think, I think it took us like two months to get three languages on uh, two languages on uh, on uh, symbolic analysis and the last three months have been consecrated no three languages on top of symbolic analysis took us two months and the three last months were were uh, focusing on javascript solidly solidly so just to give you an idea about how, how much of a beast that is <laughs> yes so, <laughs> so, uh, so the answer would be 
I mean, you also said you found, I mean, a multi set before you did, you found with the tool or like with what you previously did, like some CVEs, I mean, PHP and in open source libraries. Are you then also considering like helping out doing like finding bugs in, in open source projects? Uh, because like you, we know from the NPM and so on, like there is a lot of things out there which have like huge issues and like bringing those things um, to the surface. If we can, there's nothing that could prevent us to do that. It's not an objective on its own, and the objective is still to run a business at one point, <laughs> let's be clear. Yeah. But but if we can do that, uh, that would be really cool. I mean, that's one of the best marketing you can imagine, I believe. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so if we can contribute to, uh, to the common good by doing so, uh, sure. And uh, you can look, I, I think, at the at the blog, um, and there are a few. By our, we have a research and development team, and they do stuff like this. So basically, they uh, analyze uh, source code using well using our tool, but also with manual in inspection, mm -hmm. uh, so kind of a mix. And um, they really try to build exploits, and then they al they alert the developers, and they help them to fix that, and then they write blog posts about it. And you can find some. Oh, great! Yeah, that's awesome. Um, Patrick was actually asking, that was not me, but some other Patrick was asking, um, it, can you deal with frameworks like Hibernate or Struts? Because I think that was in the section where you said, uh, we are actually like um, calling all the code and then actually we are going to the sync. So can you deal with those frameworks as well, like inside our, our code base? That's a very good question. And uh, yes, we can uh, to some degree. So it always depends on the framework. So many frameworks require specific support. So for example, you have to know uh, kind of what things exist in that framework. And then maybe you may have to uh, model some specific functions that exist in that framework, or you may have to even model some t templating language. For example, Spring, I believe, has its own, own templating language. And so often you need some kind of specific framework support that we really have to build in to the engine, but uh, then it works. And I think we have support for the most important web frameworks out there. Correct me if I'm wrong, Nico. I'm... No, uh, I think one way also to answer the question could be um, uh, we we have you have to understand that the engine only works uh, up until its configuration, uh, just um, to the level of its configuration. So we, you have to define quite a lot of uh, knowledge to inject a lot of knowledge into the engine regarding what is a source, what is a sync. We have people that are actually, actually we call them AppSec researchers or application security researchers. Mm -hmm. They are actually making that happen. They are looking at what are vulnerabilities, how you can actually inject uh, things from uh, being a user, what are sensitive methods, defining the source and those things. And so Ibernet and Struts, for instance, are of course like the some obvious some of you things and uh, things, uh, sources and things here, here. And does that also relate to the, the escaping functions Malte was talking about? That they are safe? Because I can also imagine that they might be safe considered now, but like in a half a year time, they might be not safe anymore because we know more about it, you know? Well, okay. Um... So yes, it's related to sanitizer. So to answer the first part of the question is yes, it's completely related to sanitizer. This is part of the configuration of the engine. Like this function actually, when you have something which is sensitive that goes through that function, you know it's safe regarding this kind of sensitivity. Mm -hmm. um, regarding the, the moment in time or not things are safe, uh, this would more relate to computation problems and uh, algorithm with flows that can evolve, so we can make evolve the configuration, but that's not exactly completely applicable to the taint analysis domain, if I may. But Malte, you may complete the answer here. Uh, no, I, I fully agree. So uh, I, I, I don't really have anything to add. You answered it very well. <laughs> okay, great. So let, let's <laughs> you. come to the next question. Um, so how do you define the default values for qu uh, quality gates like complexity or maintainability? And also in the, um, um, from the perspective of real world versus tool developer bubble. Okay, so uh, I believe this one is more onto the SunarCube side and probably into uh, how, do we, how do we get to default values here? So I may not satisfy the, some rigorous mind here, but we don't have like a clearly defined process about how do we set up uh, default values. We default, we set them when we've 
what makes sense and then we rely on the fact that people will make some feedback if it doesn't make sense if we completely lose our mind we expect uh, people to make feedback so you can actually reach out i'm going to share the link to our community forum if you have some remarks about hey this default value really is not doesn't make sense for us or it doesn't make sense at all so i'm just sharing the, the link to the to the community forum we're always happy to hear feedback around this um the <laughs> the other part of the question seems a bit loaded to me about uh, tool, developer tools versus uh, real world. Well, I do understand that in some context, some default value might seem uh, too strong or too too low. I don't know. You always have the the possibility to adapt it to your context. So we, we ju I should just recommend that if you have feedback where you think like the default value makes absolutely no sense in general feel free to reach out and tell us where, where, where we are wrong. We will be happy to improve. So the, the, the tool does not prevent us from thinking, right? Because Absolutely not, actually. Because... We are very low on magic, so we have stopped uh, shipping magic uh, recently into the tool. <laughs> Great. <laughs> and there is the next question from Stefan, where he is asking if there is a list of well-known sanitizer functions from public frameworks which will be recognized and I can define, annotate with my custom sanitizer functions. There is a list uh, inside our own configuration. I believe it's not uh, public. Nope. Uh, <laughs> because this is actually a, a lot of research and we have, uh, as, as Nico mentioned before, we have our uh, application security team that mm -hmm. is essentially responsible for finding sources and sanitizers and things in frameworks among many other things. And so it's actually, uh, it's, it's nice to have an engine like this that can do all this theory, but it's really, it, it's no use at all as long as you don't have a good list of functions that are things and sanitizers and sources. And so you, you really have to put a good bit of real world knowledge in there uh, in order for the engine to actually uh, become good and, and do something sensible and, and find actual vulnerabilities in your code. And so this, since this involves quite a bit of research, I believe this is closed source. So and this is quite some knowledge here. And indeed, this is a closed source because that's not so straightforward. I mean, uh, you have a lot of companies out there making this kind of list. Uh, you can pay for having that. Uh, there is a company called White Source, I think, which is uh, offering this kind of services. And uh, I think we looked into that and trust me, it's not that uh, cheap. <laughs> so this is not a public list on our side. This is the configuration we put in there is, uh, is a bit hidden. Um, the other part of the question about defining and annotate uh, custom sanitizer functions, we do offer that, uh, although this is not like, uh, let's say the paint is not fully dry on the feature in the sense that we didn't make a huge effort in order to make this fully usable. So we started to offer this, uh, so we have this cycle of releases that are, that we call LTS, so long-term support. So from the series uh, seven, uh, we started to offer that. So you can actually inject some knowledge that are from your own frameworks into the engine. Uh, that is that is a feature which is not really promoted because for us, it's not completely, um, uh, let's say, uh, it's, it's not offering the best user experience in the world. You, you have to get your hands dirty in order to use that, let's say. Uh, and we probably will for the next LTS, which is uh, about to come next uh, f first quarter of, uh, of two, two, 2021. Uh, we want to have uh, this feature a bit more polished, but still this is not the main focus we have right now. This is possible, but this is not like the, the most finished uh, feature uh, regarding what we use, what we what we usually aim to do. Okay, great. So um, Reiner is asking, does the interprocedural analysis work in scenarios where the code base contains different languages? Does it work? That's a very nice question. And I believe in, in uh, theory, it could work, but in, in practice, it doesn't yet, at least. In theory, I'm saying it could work in principle because we have these UCFGs. So principle, you know, if we have some I don't know, Java code and a PHP code mixed or whatever. Uh, we could just generate UCFGs for both of them and then kind of, uh, uh, kind of, uh, well, analyze, analyze this on, on the UCFG level. So we don't really care about the language. 
But the question is, how exactly do they call each other? How, how does this food chain work? And how do we build the call graph in this case? Mm -hmm. so, uh, and uh, this is something that we haven't um, put any effort in yet. So and I'm not sure how, how high the value would be because I'm not sure how, how often that the in practice. But in theory, it's something that, uh, that would, would be perfectly doable with this approach. Maybe it gets more interesting as soon as people start using RAL VM more, right? So then you have like interoperability and yeah. uh, then, yeah, but okay, great. So then maybe Lian is asking, um, is there an analysis engine also for C++ available? We tried uh, to get this, uh, this kind of algorithm bound to C++, but in fact, this is not where the big value is because for C++, the main, so, uh, keeping in mind that this analysis is path insensitive and for C++, given the usual uh, flows and vulnerabilities are more linked to memory issues and buffer overflows and things like that, it's not the best technique to approach uh, vulnerabilities for C++. We tried that, uh, we tried it because there were, but it was very hard to get, let's say, very relevant results. So we didn't uh, move through. We do have some C++ of, uh, vulnerability offering though. But it's not, um, as of today, it's not uh, using the taint analysis. So do you plan another feature then? Or uh, do you yeah. have another approach actually to tackle this? Yes. Yes, there is a, there is an investigation going on for that. Okay. Indeed. Great. Um, Marcus is asking, is during the AST building, the tool chain from the LLVM involved? Most of the time, no. <laughs> uh, I, I just, okay, my C++ knowledge is very limited, so maybe I'm going to say something stupid and please correct me in the chat if I'm wrong. Uh, we use Silong for uh, Clong for uh, C++, so I'm not sure how much of LLVM is involved there, but otherwise that's, that's a no. We don't usually use LLVM for any parsing uh, or any building of the AST. Okay. And then um, last question, is my understanding correct that your algorithms are executing before traversing the trees, um, a time estimation, DFA, NFA, like big O notation for asymptotic upper bounds, since it bounds the growth of the running time from above for large enough input sizes? Oh, and it's quite difficult yeah. to understand. Yeah. This was a very long question. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm not sure That's I get the point here. Yeah. Uh, sorry, can I, can I see the question somewhere? Uh, on the side, you, you can click on chat and then Q&A. Uh, yeah. Yeah, if you can help and rephrase the question, maybe yes, I, that that could be useful here because I'm not exactly sure where is your point. We are not trying to handle the the thing is that the way we approach things. For me, we are not uh, we are linear uh, to in proportion of the number of methods as Malte mentioned in two method summaries. So I'm not sure exactly why you want to go with this question here. I'm also not sure what trees you're talking about exactly. Are you talking about the abstract syntax tree or? Good question. Um, I, don't ah. think, I don't think we can ask him because he left all. No, he's, ah. still, he's still here. Sorry, I'm wrong. Yeah. Mm. If I understand correctly, it's like, hey, given the fact that you are dealing with uh, huge graphs, uh, are you actually uh, detecting some sometimes what if the input might lead to exponential uh, execu exponential execution of your algorithm, exponential time? I'm I'm assuming here. I'm really not sure. So, but I would say that the. The thing is that we are trying to build our algorithm in such a way that we are guaranteed to not have uh, exponential time uh, execution, even though even with linear time, that can be very, very, very long. So when we do start to have some uh, exponential uh, time in the analysis, we, are, we have a bug. 
the way we try to build things basically I'm not sure it's uh... so let us read <laughs> sorry <laughs> But the complexity where you are detecting during creation of the traversing tree based on math like deterministic and all that, that it will not finish in time. No, we are not trying to assess beforehand what will be the, the, the execution time of the algorithm. We are not dealing with that as of today. We have a heuristic in place in order to cut some things here and there, but we are not trying to assess that beforehand. If, uh, if the question is, uh, if we answer the question properly. I think that's probably it. So, I, so we're not uh, trying to assess anything beforehand. So as I, I told you about those method summaries before, which kind of allow us to be linear in the number of methods. And also I've told you about those control flow graphs that con can grow very complicated when we traverse them. And we also, for each of the blocks, so for each of the nodes in the control flow graph, we similarly build also block summaries. So we also have to simulate each uh, node in the control flow graph only once. Um, so the only problem that we can have where things can explode exponentially if kind of symbols symbols can grow very complex uh, if you if you build some clever code in order to do that and in those cases we just have some heuristics in place that would say okay this symbol now is growing too complex and we, we cut off here and we don't uh, we don't analyze any deeper but we don't do this beforehand great that was actually something we we start to uh, to think about uh, when doing vision uh, when doing fixed point analysis in order to think about can we think of some type topology of uh, call graphs and location graphs that could actually lead us to think that hey we should probably not go that route because that won't work but we didn't solve that problem <laughs> at all maybe not yet right. So um, there are no more questions in the in the Q and A section. So I would say, like, since the time box is also already over, I would say uh, we are finishing for tonight. So it was a pleasure actually to have you um, for the talk, and it was great um, that you could present like the way how you are doing this analysis. I think it's quite interesting, also like seeing it from a different perspective. And probably also learning something more about vulnerabilities today. So um, I just want to thank as well, like um, all our sponsors we have from the Chavi user group to make actually these whole things happening as well. You, Malte and Nicola, and also like um, the supporting stuff in the background, like Ursula and Marcus, um, who are helping out and helping making this possible as well. Right. Then actually, the last thing I want to say is please provide us with feedback. So when we end the webinar or if you leave your forward to the form, so it's always great to know like if I, if we can invite these um, um, speakers again with another talk and um, we ha always love to have some feedback so that you can see how we can improve. So thanks again. And um, when we are going to finish the webinar, we are just kicked out and we cannot say bye bye anymore. So that's why I'm saying bye, Malte, bye, Nicolas, bye, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you very much for, for coming us. It was a pleasure. Yeah. See you. Okay. Have a nice evening. <laughs>